Welcome to Resiliency Radio with Dr. Jill, your go-to podcast for the most cutting edge insights in functional and integrative medicine. I'm Dr. Jill, your host, and with each episode, we delve into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Today, we're here to explore the frontiers of health and intricate workings of microbiology. And today, especially, we're going to talk about radiology and gadolinium and heavy metal toxicity. Um, now, if you like this video, be sure to hit the like icon, share it. If you're listening on Stitcher or a Spotify or anywhere you listen to podcasts, leave a review. It helps us to reach more people. So without further ado, let me introduce my guest today. Dr. Samelka has been one of the major forces in radiology for three decades. He has been a leading researcher and practitioner in MRI, has pioneered and is leading author worldwide on abdominal MRI, and is a radiologist with the broadest research and publication record for on safety in radiology, having authored major works on informed consent, overuse of imaging, risk of cancer from CT and x-rays, um, nephrogenic system fibrosis, gadolinium deposition in the brain on MRI, and most recently has pioneered in the medical literature on the subject of gadolinium deposition disease, or GDD. Today, we're going to talk about that, so stay tuned. And he's presently the leading author on the subject. GDD is essentially a severe persistent disease secondary to the use of gadolinium-based contrast agents in individuals who have normal kidney function. Dr. Samelka has written over 350 peer-reviewed articles in radiology and 17 textbooks, including healthcare reform in radiology. He's been one of the most accomplished authors on safety, especially regarding medical radiation, patient information, and overuse, as we mentioned. Um, I am so, so delighted to be here with you as an expert and author on this topic that just doesn't get enough attention. So welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on your program. I'm delighted to be here. You are welcome. And this is such an area of interest because as I could tell in your writings and your paper, and you sent me one of the most recent papers, we'll be sure and link for anyone listening to some of um, Dr. Samelka's papers and research. Um, so stay tuned wherever you're listening or watching this in the notes, you'll have access to all the information we're talking about. Before we dive into gadolinium and heavy metals and maybe the overuse and some of the practices, I would just like to hear a little bit about your story. Uh, how did you get into the practice of medicine? How did you choose radiology? And tell me just a little bit about your journey into where you've been. Okay, I'll try to make it as quick as possible. I'm actually uh, from Winnipeg, Canada, and both of my parents were physicians. So being medical doctor was the thing that was most apparent to me. Yeah. Now, I had originally intended to do plastic surgery of uh, when I was going in, into medicine, but, um, and I, it's a funny way to say this, but my mother was a radiologist. Uh -huh. So I was familiar with radiology and just at the time in medical school, trying to decide what I will do with my career, new things like CT had come out and yeah. radiology was changing and getting exciting. So it was no longer reading plain x-rays uh -huh. or you know, doing ultrasound. It just came out. It was, CT was on the horizon, and then um, MRI also came onto the horizon, and that sort of convinced me to go into radiology. So I did my original training in radiology in Winnipeg, Canada, and then through the course of my training, I became intrigued with a new thing, the new imaging kit in town, which was MRI, and, you know, my... Um, my chief professor who I worked with in Winnipeg said, you know what? I went to UCSF in California. It was a fabulous time. Why don't you go there? So I ended up going to UCSF for specialized training in um, MRI of, of the body. And from there, I went to Germany for six months to work with the research team of Siemens and MR. And then as a Canadian, I went back to Canada for two years but, um, you know, the problem is that once once you leave a place that's very cold, like once you've left Siberia uh -huh. and you've gone to, you know, the Mediterranean, it's kind of difficult to still live in Siberia. And I hate to say that to all the Canadians <laughs> out there, but I just, it was just too cold. And it's funny how, you know, you, you just need a brief experience, like two years in San Francisco, yeah. and I was ruined for minus 30 degrees in February in the wintertime. So I came to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and I've been here essentially since then for 
24 years working at uh, UNC as a director of MR services for all of that time, director of, of uh, vice chair of quality and safety for part of that time, vice chair of research for part of that time. And now I'm basically doing some radiology, still uh, uh, focusing on body MR, but I've happened upon, you know, looking after people with gadolinium deposition disease. And I'll tell you, and I'll try to be brief about this as well, how that happened as a director of MR services at UNC. It turned out that a patient who actually has become one of my favorite uh, people and, uh, and I work with her, she and her husband came to my house on a Sunday during the day, and she said, you know, I had an MRI at your facility, and after that, I had a feeling of burning, like my entire body was on fire yes. for months, and nobody knew what it was. And I think it was the gadolinium that I received. And you know, I listened to this, and I said to her, you've come to the right person. So, you know, then, you know, turns out a senior physician, female physician at UNC also then approached me not too long after that and said that she also had this disease. And based on that, and the fact that I was maybe at the time the leading author worldwide on the value of gadolinium, I thought, well, who better to write on limitations than me? Now, some of it you could argue maybe it's a feeling of penance, and that's maybe true. But I think one of the things that's characterized me in my career is that I really care about the welfare of people, and I can actually put myself in their position. You know, so I can feel what it must be like to go in, get an MR study with gadolinium, being told everything is safe, not to worry, it's the safest thing, your kidneys are fine, don't worry about it, everything will be wonderful, and then end up with a horrific set of feelings that you feel you're going to die, yeah. I can appreciate how that would feel like. So I've take, taken this on as a um, cause, uh, my cause. And, you know, the good news is that um, it's uh, kind of easy to diagnose. And if caught early, it's also quite readily treatable looking at all sort of comparable diseases. And I don't know, Jill, if at this point I, you want me to continue and talk about um, the diagnosis of GDD or if you have a question you'd like to uh, add in at this point. I just want to comment, first of all, yes, we're going to go to, so if you're listening, stay tuned. We're going to talk about diagnosis and treatment. And this is, we're literally talking with a world expert. I am so honored to be here with you, Dr. Samilka. And I just want to say like on a human to human level, I have such a deep respect already getting to know you and what you've told me, because what I hear is so often we go to medical school and then after medical school, we think we've learned everything we need to know. Right. And then many doctors don't continue learning or being curious. And the first thing that I hear is you were curious about, well, what if, what if there was some problem here? And I think way back to the times when they were delivering babies after doing autopsies and not washing their hands. Right. And that started this sepsis and the maternal um, mortality rate was so high because they were taking this bacteria from the cadavers and then delivering babies. And it was literally doctors causing harm. And you and I took the Hippocratic oath and said, first, do no harm. And so part of that, I think, is remaining curious to, could there be some things, whether it's a drug we're prescribing or a procedure we're doing and just remaining open? And I just loved hearing your story because what it shows is this deeply compassionate human being that you are and you were open because it could, I mean, that takes a lot of humility because here you are that world's expert on gadolinium and then to say, well, what if there could also be some harm? And I want to just publicly honor you for that heart that you have because there are people on all kinds of procedures and things that we do that can have harm because it's the spectrum people, right? So let's dive in with that. But I just want to honor you publicly for your work and for your humility, your compassion, and your curiosity, because it takes a huge heart um, to do that and to say, well, what if? So then you did have, obviously, with these two patients kind of start to question and say, what if? So tell us then about how did you determine that there could be possible toxicity? And then we'll talk about like, how do you diagnose it in a patient who's having symptoms? Well, um, you know, the, the other thing that's kind of, um, you know, a lot of this also, also comes with some 
uh, sadness on many levels, sadness of the illness of the patients, but also uh, sadness in um, the unwillingness of many physicians to see what should be very obvious. And the way I sort of like to think of it um, is that if you were an eight-year-old child and somebody told you, hey, I just had a imaging study and they injected some fluid in me and right afterwards, I felt really very sick. What could it be? Do you think it's maybe the presentation of lupus suddenly or ALS suddenly, or is it what you just got put into your body? You know, and to me, it's kind of so obvious that uh, that um, you know, if you have developed suddenly symptoms that you didn't have before, and it came right on after the gadolinium injection, mm -hmm. why wouldn't it be this? And then the next thing is to figure out, you know, the features of the disease. Yeah. So one of the things that I think is very important, and maybe it's worth repeating. Um, to your audience uh, a couple of times, but um, the symptoms that are sort of classical, and, and the thing that you have to remember is that gadolinium goes everywhere in your body. Yes. And as we're learning from the COVID uh, virus, where we thought, well, just a lung thing, but right. we're learning it's oh, going it's everywhere. All the tissues, yeah. So, so gadolinium is going everywhere. So the symptoms can involve everywhere because it's going everywhere. But the classic symptoms are, and again, I think because it's given intravenous, one of the more distinctive symptoms that makes it different than many of the, um, what I would call it, part of the group of immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. Yeah. What makes it different, I think, is that the extreme burning that people can, can experience. So for me, the five classic symptoms are skin burning, a bone pain, and it's not like, oh, uh, you know, what is that pain? It's like a screwdriver being rammed into your bone. And what's distinctive are rib bone pains because, you know, a lot of people have knee pain and so on. If you get knee pain, you know, is that just the knee pain I have or is it from gadolinium? So right. any of the bones and joints can, can get very painful. Then the other feature is brain fog. So many people, and, and uh, I know Dr. Jill, dealing with the range of diseases that you deal with, brain fog is a feature of them as well. Yeah. So you also know how, how how individuals will tell you, you know, I can't remember anything. Yeah. Or, you know, I, I've entered in a room, I have no idea why I'm in this room. And all sorts of cognitive impairments beyond just um, forgetfulness, but um, confusion. So the, and then the other feature is pins and needle sensations that can be anywhere. And the pins and needles, again, is a symptom that's classic for small fiber uh, nerve disease. And the other feature that I like to focus on is fasciculations. So a muscle twitching that could be anywhere. So those are sort of the five classic symptoms. But then beyond that, you know, we could talk just about all the different symptoms. But the other second grouping that's very common are people will describe a head pain that they don't call like a headache. It's a head pain. And I think the best description of it is that it's like having a swimming cap put on your head, but which is three times too small. So wow. it's like a constrictive pain. Yeah. Then vision is quite common. Hearing is very common. Cardiac arrhythmias and bowel, ab bowel abnormalities, usually uh, stasis, so ileus type uh, patterns. Mm -hmm. And then imbalance. Patients can experience incredible imbalance. So those are, I think, the most important symptoms to to that people should know uh, that they may have. And unfortunately, at this point in time, most of the patients with disease, this disease, they've made their own diagnosis. Yes. Because they've gone in to see their doctors. Their doctors will say, hey, it can't be gadolinium because you have normal kidney function. And the only people who have problems with gadolinium are patients with poor kidneys who get nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. So it's kind of tragic that most of the time, the people who come to me, they've made their own diagnosis. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science and Faith, is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness 
and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. So I noticed that in your bio, as I read that um, in normal kidney function, which again, for most physicians are worried about abnormal kidney function, because if you're listening and you don't know all the medical technology here, our kidneys are filtering these dyes and things that we put into our body. That's our natural way between liver, kidney, and that's one of the organs. So if your kidneys aren't functioning as a, a healthy filter, of course, you could have more toxicity from something you put in intravenously. But what you're saying in your article in today is that uh, many people are complaining of symptoms with totally normal kidney function, which again, from us medical professionals, if you're listening, you should be aware of this as well. What percentage would you say? Um, and interestingly, I just want to say a little backstory. Um, my interest in this, I wrote an article and I think that's how we connected and I am not the expert, but just like you, I saw a handful of people that came back and said, the day of my um, MRI, this is what happened. And it sounded just like what you described, the burning, the brain fog, the neuropathic kind of neuropathy, numbness, tingling, a lot of those symptoms. And same as you, I said, well, huh, could it be connected? And I didn't assume anything. I just was open. And then I started reading more about some of your articles, the stuff you've published. So the same way that you came to this was um, as well for me when I heard patients complaining. So now that you've been writing, I'm sure you get contacted a lot, but say you have a thousand or 10,000 patients who get a, a gadolinium MRI, what percentage might um, have GDD? Have you, do you have any sort of statistics on this? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I think the next the next question is who gets it and mm -hmm. and how frequent is Who's it? Who's at risk, yeah. So one, of the, one of the things, I think one of the reasons why radiologists don't want to accept the diagnosis is because they fear it will create a sense in the public that it's extremely toxic and nobody should get it and we don't want the gadolinium and we don't want to get MRIs and so on. And, and I think... They have that sort of chicken little fear of running around and worrying that the sky is falling. Mm -hmm. But one of the first things I tell also to people who are going to get an MR and email me and are sort of in a panic about it. So one of the things that I say, first off, is it's relatively uncommon in the general public. Yeah. So about one in 10,000 people will get this disease. So that's one of the excuses that I have that radiologists and other physicians may not want to accept it because they may not have seen it. The other big problem of radiologists, which includes me and in my former my former yeah. life, is uh, that we never see patients. Yeah. We never see patients. So if you're, you're in the dark patients, room, right? In the basement of the hospital. <laughs> you never see patients. Well, guess what? You don't know if there's some lasting problem that they get. You know, I mean, it just is that simple. So about one in 10,000 people can get it. Okay. So it's not that common. The people most likely to get it, Dr. Jill, as I look at you, are people like yourself, Yeah. are white women, first off, but then you add on to it the areas that that you have done a lot of work in. So anything that, that sets off your immune system, anything that I... Uh, consider in the cluster of entities of T cell dysregulations, which includes, you know, regular autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, but the whole grouping of conditions like chronic uh, inflammatory syndrome or chronic fatigue syndrome, or even mold toxicity, fibromyalgia, yeah. um, chronic Lyme disease, chronic viral disease, these are all conditions that have set your immune system off yeah. So it has a T cell dysregulation. And I'll give you a Latin quote that I'm very fond of that makes me think of all of these. And that is abyssus, abyssum invocat. One hell calls forth another. 
Oh, so true. So once you get... thinking is like it's primed, right? Oh. Your immune system is primed when you have a lot of these infectious, right. toxic things that have triggered an immune response. And so exactly. no wonder a t- another chemical um, can add to that load. Right. Yeah. So many, many of the people uh, come in, though, they will have a history of what you could call multiple chemical sensitivity syndrome or the other things that I mentioned okay. in that sort of cluster of unusual uh-huh. um, immune mediated diseases. And once you have one of them, you're a setup for getting another. And that's why one of the things that I worry about, for instance, with the COVID uh, long haul and the COVID vaccine long haul, is that once you have one of these conditions, and what we do nowadays with everybody who has some sort of weird neural thing is they get an MR with gadolinium. Right, right. So once you get that, you know, in a number of people, particularly if they get repeat gadolinium injections. Yeah then you have gadolinium deposition disease and that then becomes your dominant uh, inflammatory condition. Well, the good news is that we can actually treat that. But one of the things that I do want to emphasize, and this is a good point to do this, uh, uh, Dr. Jill, and that is if somebody is sick from gadolinium the first time through, Mm -hmm. you know, at MR, we all, before an MR, we have a check sheet that we give patients about things, you know, yeah. uh, do you have like a cardiac pacemaker clips in your brain or so on? You have to ask people, have you had a previous gadolinium injection? Yes. And did you have persistent, persistent symptoms afterwards? Because quite often what happens with the first onset of GDD, it may go away in a few months. So they will get this like burning and brain fog and then it goes away. Yeah. And then, you know, they're better. But with each successive MR uh, scan, the disease becomes uh, more ingrained and more difficult to remove. And you get progressively sicker and sicker. So you get, so a number of my individuals, they have this and they get neural symptoms. And then, well, how are we going to investigate neural symptoms? We'll do another MR with yes. gadolinium. And the month later, they're worse. Oh, maybe it's a progressive a neural condition like MS. Let's yeah. do another MR with gadolinium. So I have patients that have had maybe 15 gadolinium injections in a row, all of them to investigate what the was gadolinium that started after the first. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So when I asked so, go ahead. I was, I was just going to say, if you are a white female, but it's not only, you know, everybody can get it. I mean, uh, yeah. white men are probably the next most common group, but the combination of having a pre-existent something that you describe as the entities that that I mentioned and the ones that you specialize in, um, you're a setup for getting this. So fascinating because women we know have four or more times the autoimmune risk, which is kind of in this realm. And that makes a lot of sense. One just thought personally that I think a lot of women may be facing, I'm a breast cancer survivor. I had breast cancer at 25. So of course my follow-up could involve MRIs as a young woman with dense breast tissue. And I've had multiple with gadolinium. And of course, you know, as a radiologist, they really won't do for breast cancer, um, screening or post-treatment, it's pretty hard to do a non-gadolinium MRI for the breast. Is that correct? Because I've always been told. The rule, yeah, they they would not want to do that. Now, not yeah. to say that it can't be done, but in part, I think, you know, we, for a number of reasons, we want to have the least likelihood of making a mistake. Yeah. There's good reason, like the best Absolutely. thing for the patient. And there's the other reasons that, you know, radiologists and absolutely. Other and that's what I want to say too. For that's why we overuse. Yeah. Overuse. Yeah. And I Imagine. remember just in my early forties and some of the screening where I found a lump and it turned out to be nothing, but I had, uh, I think two MRIs in the same year. And then it was, they were recommending a third. It was like every six months and they were all with gadolinium. Now I have not had any side effects or symptoms, thank goodness from gadolinium, but intuitively on that third one, I thought, you know what? I'm not going to take a risk of one more gadolinium uh, MRI. And again, I had multiple and I've had other ones as well. So this isn't something that I've totally avoided, but it was interesting because even me personally, I thought, you know what? I don't think that's worth the extra risk of getting a third MRI within 18 months with gadolinium. Um, And so I chose not to, and it turned out to be all benign and everything was okay. But there is this, I maybe talk about this because as a radiologist, you're trying to diagnose disease, help patients identify cancers, brain tumors, um, multiple sclerosis. 
And so with some of these things, the gadolinium is really, really important because it, it enhances certain tissues. Do you want to talk first to the to patient, but also to the doctors about, because even as I'm an MD, but I'm not a radiologist. So sometimes I'll call someone like you and say, for this condition, do I want contrast or not contrast? Maybe just first mention to the public and to the doctors, why would we do a, a gadolinium enhanced MRI versus a non-enhanced MRI? What's the kinds of things we'd see differently? Well, as, as a general rule, um, with gadolinium is, if you think of sort of the gr broadest range of all organ systems, Gadolinium allows you to see the presence of enhancement and the absence of enhancement better than anything else. So if we're looking for small tumors, so my particular area of expertise is the liver and uh, pancreas and I guess the other organs in the upper abdomen. Um, my, um, If you're looking for a small hepatocellular carcinoma yeah. to look for the, the pattern of enhancement that, it, that uh, cancers have, you kind of don't want to miss them. Now, yes. the question is, how often should you do these studies? And can you interleave other, uh, you know, MRs without contrast? And I think a lot more thought has to be done in minimizing the number of times you may do the optimal study. So yes, right. it's by and large extremely helpful for looking for cancer, but can you use that enhancement template on a, a new study without contrast and then just transfer where you saw the enhancement and look at the morphology of that now. I think a lot more attention and uh, focus, and this may be something that artificial intelligence would yes. readily be able to do. So I'm, I'm just, you know, in my earlier um, years, uh, we were th we thought that gallon was the safest water. Yeah. So. I would think, you know, with patients with chronic liver disease, huh, let's do, you know, another MR in three months time. Now I spend a lot of time thinking about how soon I want to do Way, it. Right? right, exactly. <laughs> right. So there's that. What we probably not, but maybe Dr. Jewell will have different discussions on different aspects of imaging the future. But for instance, you know, the, the reliance of other technology that we imaging wise that we don't inform of patients of the risk yeah. to me is, uh, I hate to say it, but it's shameful. Mm -hmm. So there's a great en enamor of, um, of PET and PET-CT, yeah. but the radiation doses in uh, PET-CT are enormous. Mm -hmm. And the new, um, the new radio tracers that are coming out, they yeah. sound great. A and some of them do wonderful things, but what is the dose and what is the risk to the patient? Yeah. And that, I tell you, a nuclear medicine pet, and I hate to say that, yeah. it's the one group that really seems to avoid talking about safety. And to me, it's unconscionable. Yeah. You know, again, just for those listening who may not, you and I know about radiation and doses, but do you want to just briefly talk about like a regular x-ray, chest x-ray versus a CT versus a nuclear med test? And for the consumer who maybe doesn't know what they're getting, kind of the numbers of how much... Um, more radiation they're getting with some of these studies compared to a regular chest x-ray? Okay. Well, now it's interesting. Before I got into the MR and the gadolinium safety, I was really focused on CT and radiation. And I like to think that that work, because I would say that I was one of the first, maybe the first uh, university radiologist to write about this subject. Now, there was a cardiologist who wrote in, it's funny, I didn't wasn't aware of his work, but some months earlier, Eugenio Picano from Italy on the same subject of radiation doses. But at the time, most body CTs involved, um, and I'll just have to use these units, okay? Sure. 10 millisieverts of radiation. Now, if you look at the FDA web website on, on um, radiation risk, 10 millisieverts in a 40-year-old male is associated with a one in a thousand chance of cancer. Now, a lot of people will use that number and translate it to everybody else, but it's not the case too. Because it, you know, you think you know about medical radiation, you think, well, 10 millisieverts is one in a thousand of cancer. Well, in a one-year-old female, 10 millisieverts of radiation is associated with something like one in a hundred or one in two hundred wow. chance of cancer. So an entirely different yeah. uh, ball game. So 
what happened in the evolution of CT, which is one of the things, you know, that great things do happen in medicine. Yeah. It was sort of, you know, 10 millisieverts and many children were done at adults, things and so on. But uh, through the course from about 2005 to 2010, um, um, CT scanners were designed to deliver less radiation doses and protocols were designed to, uh, to also have less scanning. So nowadays, where, where a typical abdomen CT was 10 millisieverts maybe 15 years ago, now it's maybe three millisieverts. Wow. And the other thing that's important to keep in mind, and it, it's, you know, it's, um, it's difficult when to tell people when there's a risk. Yeah. And there was a study that was done by the VA system maybe 20 years ago published in uh, New England Journal that described, you know, if the risk is something like one in 40,000, you should probably inform patients that there's that risk. So um, I think with, you know, a lower risk, I think patients should be aware of it, but aware that the risk is relatively low. Okay. And even though in the radiation literature, the sort of um, radiation biology literature, the, um, they describe there's no lower limit of risk, mm -hmm. The lower limit I use is one millisievert. So right now, one millisievert would be a brain CT to suggest that one brain CT done is probably not a huge thing. Now, in contrast, when you talked about chest X-rays, that's about um, 0 0.01 millisievert. So about a thousand the amount, one thousandth the amount of radiation. Now, PET CT combines both PET and CT. And traditionally, that radiation dose is 20 millisieverts. Okay. So we'd have to go to the books and then calculate what is yeah. the risk. And again, not only, and you as a female physician, you also know that most of the risks and so on have been determined for males, Yeah, but it's different for females and not enough research has been done on females, but the risks are then much higher. And you can't just simply do them every three months yeah. and say, well, there's going to be no problems. Particularly, you know, I, I sort of, in a dark humor, think about with if you're doing this every three months in a cancer patient and 10 millisieverts is a one in a thousand chance of cancer and 25 millisieverts is maybe one in 300 chance of cancer. You're given something that can cause cancer to people who already have shown you they yeah. can develop cancer. Yeah. You know, so it seems on the surface a little bit crazy. So that's why I recommend that you interleave them. So again, interleaving uh, PET CT, which for many things is really the gold standard, huh? but interleave it with regular CT. Some things could be interleaved with ultrasound. Some yep. things uh, interleaved with MR. And if it's not with gadolinium, MR is extremely safe. Yes. So I, I just think that there has to be a lot more thought placed into these things, but it needs to be people like by self are interested in safety. Yeah. And right now, you know, right now, my time is focused on this one area of gadolinium toxicity, and well, by I extension, actually heavy metals in general toxicity. Yeah. So hang on, if you're listening, we are going to get to treatment in just a moment. But this is so important, because the other thing that I hear you saying is, or I see in clinical practice, someone say, oh, well, I really need a pet, I need a pet scan and I really need this or, and patients are starting to demand. And a lot of times as physicians, we're trying to please the, you know, insurance and the patients and trying to balance all these needs. And sometimes when a patient comes and really, really requests an imaging, you know, we just order it and we don't think, but I think that as if you're out there listening to your patient, I think it's your responsibility as well to know the risk and to not over ask for the things. And again, we as physicians, number one, it's our responsibility, informed consent. But I want patients to know too, that there's no thing without a risk that you ask for, whether it's a drug or a treatment or an, an image and just knowing and starting to understand that um, is important. So I want to be the first to say, I want to educate physicians and patients about the benefits and the risk. Um, so thank you for being on the forefront. Let's turn to treatment because obviously you have studied GDD and it sounds like you've given us kind of the set of symptoms. Is there a diagnostic criteria? Is it mostly a clinical diagnosis? Um, so let's go like, what does diagnosis really look like? And then what do we do for treatment? So the diagnosis really at this point is um, 
generally most people develop symptoms within 24 to 48 hours. Um, but, it, but it can extend beyond that to at least a month. So I accept these new type of symptoms like I described, new symptoms within a month period, GDD is, is a likely entity and maybe the obvious entity. Um, at this point in time, our first uh, treatment is actually the uh, best diagnostic tool to confirm that the patient has GDD. So I'll sort of interleave into treatment as we talk about diagnosis. The, the best treatment, and again, this actually applies to all heavy metals. And again, to yeah. me, it's kind of obvious, but people don't necessarily understand the obvious. But if you're trying to remove a metal from the body, you want to use um, a chelator, which has the strongest um, uh, adherence yes. to whatever metal it is you're looking at. And one of the analogies I've used is the... Um, magnet crane game that used to be present in like grocery stores where you have a, mm -hmm. a crane with a magnet on it and all these little stuffed nasty animals yes, yes. and great plastic rings and so on and then it sticks on that and it transports sometimes all the way through but oftentimes re-releases it right right which with metal terms yes. we call redistribution mm -hmm. and then it mm -hmm. will take it over and drop it into the chute sometimes so you want to have something that's really powerful that hangs on and stays hanging on yep. and doesn't re-release it. So, mm -hmm. so we call that, um, and we call that the uh, stability constant. Amazing. So, you have to know the stability constant if you're going to use a chelator. Now, a number of people mm -hmm. just randomly use chelators, but you have to know the stability constant with the metal that you're interested in. And it's knowable. It's a lab uh, measurement, but it is knowable. And if it isn't, if it, the uh, manufacturer hasn't determined it yet for that metal, then maybe you shouldn't do it because yeah. there's others where the stability constant is known. So for instance, with, with gadolinium, the most stable chelator currently on the market is DTPA. Yep. So now I'm just using by memory uh, numbers. So these aren't the yeah. exact numbers, but the chelator that's oftentimes used is EDTA, the yeah. stability constant, and it's actually the log stability constant, but stability constant is 17 mm -hmm. for gadolinium with EDTA. For DTPA in gadolinium, the stability constant is about uh, 20. So in log terms, or actually it's maybe 20, it, it's, it's higher than that. It's, it's actually uh, around 22. Yeah. So 17 versus 22. So that actually by log scale is something like 300,000 times. And those are the right numbers. That's not, I'm not making a mistake. Yeah. 300,000 times more stable. So you would think, well, geez, if the whole basis of this is to hang on to the metal, shouldn't I use the thing that's most likely to hang on to it? Because if you don't hang on to it, what happens is you re-release it back yeah. into the body and then it goes to somewhere else. Yeah. So the other critical thing about the di diagnosis when I talked about chelation, so we will chelate with um, DTPA uh -huh. and the things that I look for to confirm the diagnosis is if you were sick from the gadolinium when it went in and you're still sick from the gadolinium, when we remobilize it yes. in your body and it goes into the circulation, it should make you sick again, right? Yeah. Yes. So we call that um, gadolinium removal flare. Yeah. So you have to have gadolinium removal flare if you have gadolinium deposition disease. Otherwise, you have something else. Yeah. And the other um, flare that's sort of very interesting that you also have to have is what I call gadolinium equilibration uh, flare. And that comes on about three weeks later. Because what happens with metals and heavy metals uh, heavy metals in general, is that it's distributed in the body in various tissues at various um, strengths of adherence. And then in l some repositories, it's very durable. So using gadolinium and lead is very similar in yes. this regard. The two largest areas that gadolinium goes to are the skin, 
where it's easy for us to remove GAD and the bone where it's difficult. Yeah. So DTPA can remove GAD directly from bone, but doesn't do it that well. Um, so what we then rely on is what's called uh, Le Chatelier's principle, uh -huh. which is everything strives to be in equilibrium. So the GAD removal flare occurs immediately. And at the same time, if you've used a poor chelator, you will get gadolinium redis uh, redistribution flare. That They both occur immediately. About three weeks later, it becomes most noticeable of GAD re-equilibration flare. And what that reflects is since a lot of the gadolinium you've removed has come from skin, some of it from brain and other soft organs, very little from bone, mm -hmm. what happens if at one point you, you know, bone was here, skin yes. was here, well, you've pulled it out from skin and now the difference is huge. So re-equilibration is now bone moves back yep. to bring in gadolinium to skin. So that happens in force at about three weeks. So you will get a re-equilibration flare at three weeks time. Wow. And that has to occur as well. And that's very distinctive. And people will panic and think, oh my God, now I'm getting worse again. And this didn't work. The chelation didn't work. No, this is what has to happen. And what's important for me to tell patients, and I think that's important for all patients, they want to know what they're going to feel. They don't want it yes. to be a, a mystery. Yes. So I tell them you have to have a, um, a removal flare and you have to have a re-equilibration flare. If you don't, then you don't have the disease. Yeah. Now, with time, I've learned to manage that more. Yeah. So we start by giving people lesser amounts of chelator to begin with, and we give them IV steroids. And we generally, we then then try to increase the amount of chelation with time yeah. and decrease the, the steroids to have a balance. So we basically treat treat it like an acute hypersensitivity reaction, yes. the chelation process, because if you're sick from gallium and then you re remobilize it, yeah, you're gonna get sick again. So we use the steroids as we use uh, acute hypersensitivity reaction management. And we also use the steroid taper as you would with yeah. any sort of severe uh, allergy. This makes so much sense because I'm in the world of, I've done stuff with lead and metals chelation. So I know that EDT is better for lead, DMSA is better for mercury, and we don't mix those two. Because again, this uh, uh, coefficient of basically the crane analogy, I love that. So um, applicable. And then I also deal with uh, toxic mold in the environment and the accumulation in the fatty tissues. And so I know that as I'm detoxing a patient, same thing, they're mobilizing that from their tissues into the bloodstream where the liver and the kidneys are filtering. But if I mobilize quicker than they can excrete, which is exactly what you're talking about, then they get actually, right. they're mobilizing, their blood is actually almost like toxic for metals or or from, for my case, the mycotoxins, and they get really sick. And I'm always, as a doc, have to really check in carefully because I know I can mobilize very quickly and make them very, very ill, but I don't want to because I have to make sure they're excreting that load. So I really what? love how you describe that and can so relate to the patients that I've treated on a different level. Um, and, yeah. it makes yeah. and even like you said, um, uh, framing the uh, expectations, because often I say, okay, this is what you should expect. If this X, Y, Z happens, that's okay. But if it goes on to be this thing, you need to call me right away and we need to. So really brilliant that you have discovered that and, and you know, and also understand that it's going to be, we call it sometimes a Herxheimer, the Jack's Herxheimer reaction, which isn't very specific, but in a way it's this mobilizing and excreting and getting stuck in between. Um, now, one thought is from my experience with metals is the kidneys are a big, like, that's where we do a lot of our metal detox through the urinary tract and the kidneys. Um, have you seen elevations in creatine or kidney function disturbances during chelate or during the process? And do you do anything specific besides hydration to support the kidneys? <clears throat> now, see, that's actually also very, um, that's a very interesting point as well. And I think after this, I'd like to circle back to talk about... Um, sure how to manage toxicities, yes. Yes. but um, so I'm telling you that, so I don't, don't forget myself, but you know, gallium is going everywhere. So it's yeah. also going to the kidneys. Mm -hmm. And since we're removing uh, gadolinium from soft tissues, including the kidneys, yeah. my uh, empirical thinking, and it's sort of borne out the times that we've looked at it is the kidney function actually improves because ah. you're getting, yeah. you're pulling out of the parenchyma of the kidneys 
the gadolinium to put it into the exactly. urinary system to have it removed. Mm -hmm. So in fact, if anything, the renal function improves. And that's why, you know, I don't really use, although I'll, I'll get a measure of the renal function to begin yeah. with, I don't really use that too much to prevent me from, from Perfect. doing treatment because really in this disease, the only treatment is to get rid of the yeah. metal. You have to go and, through that, don't you? That process. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, so the thing that I, I think is also very important, and it's interesting how with different um, toxins, the emphasis is slightly different based on the nature of how how treatment and recovery goes. Yeah. So I think for all toxins, uh, the first step is to not get it ever again. Right. So the prevention the is way more important, right? If we could just really right. come in right. Yeah. So the first treatment yeah. I tell people with gadolinium deposition disease is don't ever get a gadolinium injection again. So if your doctor tells you to get it, don't get it. And I said, even if I tell you to get it, yeah. don't get it yeah. because you have a T cell dysregulation of the gadolinium and you will react to it. So that really works for everything. You know, if you're in a very healthy environment, right. get out of that exactly. environment. Exactly. Let's not right? get that exposure. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> Yeah. The first, the yeah. first rule of treatment. It's now, funny. I just want to say rules... there's a whole big, big popular community out there of mold avoidance, right? So it's funny because it's almost right. like m not made fun of because it's a very real thing, but it's the same idea. Like right. if everybody thought about it that way, why don't we just avoid it? <laughs> right. Yeah. So then the, the next two, um, two forms of treatment are uh, detoxification and removal. Uh -huh. Now, you know, I have found, and this is not an area that I'm an expert in, and in the future, um, I think I'd be interested to pick your brains on different aspects of detoxification, because I know that you're a great expert in this. But for me, the most important thing about getting people healthy is to get their general diet healthy. And if you think about it, that's probably works for everyone in the population. That's why we're such in such a bad uh, condition a, a, yeah. as a public because we eat all these foods that are highly processed. So natural foods, yeah. limit the amount of sugar as much as you can, you know, probably limit, you know, the amount of gluten you get, yeah. limit somewhat the dairy and just, and do um, physical activity and try to, you know, get fresh, clean air. And that kind of works for everything. Now there's nuances in different, you know, food groups. And, yeah. you know, for instance, the, the food that I like to focus on from a heavy metal point of view is kale, yeah. which should be fundamentally the healthiest of vegetables, but in the modern era, and that's what we have to always update our learning on yes. in the modern era, because of the nature of it being a cruciferous vegetable, yes. that's very good at concentrating sulfur. Exactly. It also mm -hmm. concentrates thallium yes. and cesium. Mm -hmm. So when I look at the, so I get urines, uh, critical for evaluation is we get 24 hour urines. I always want to get them before yeah. and after chelation because I want to know what their baseline is. I want to know how much I pull out of various metals, yeah. which, um, which, and I don't just look at gadolinium. So I get the panel, the full panel and I think yeah. Genova, but I use doctor's data, but Genova mm -hmm. I think does the same. I get the panel of metals. Yes. And we also, yes. it makes common sense that they also interact. Yes. It turns out that DTPA does a great job of removing both lead and gadolin and gadolinium. Mm -hmm. And you have to see with the other metals to what extent it removes others. Because mercury is very variable, as you know, yes. because there's inorganic and organic varieties of mercury. And so I'm now in the phase where I'm looking at, you know, I've sort of been forced into the phase of not only dealing with gadolinium yeah. where I started with, now I have to think about all these other heavy metals and also have to pay attention to what else they may have, yeah. which is mold, chronic yep. Lyme and so on. So, you know, it's one of those things, right? Like I, I have to learn I, about all this stuff. I say, I, same way I was always like, I'm never going to do lime or mold. It's complex. I don't understand it. And then you have to, if you really want to help people, because it's inevitable out there, these tick-borne infections are creeping into the suburban environments and more and more common. Um, one thing interesting, I loved what you said about food, because one of the things I always say is just clean air, clean water, clean food. We start with those very, very basic principles. And that's like half of detox. And it sounds so simple. Yeah. It's not always easy to do, but it's such a foundational principle, just like you said, right. to start. Um, 
you mentioned toxicity. So let's come back to like, when you're treating a patient, what do you do to help them deal with the reactions? Um, in our last few minutes or so, let's talk just a little bit about that and then we can wrap up. Okay. So, um, I, I treat it like they're they're gonna have an acute hypersensitivity reaction. So I give them, uh, and I, I prefer methylprednisolone, mm -hmm. which is solumedrol in IV form and mm -hmm. then in pill form because it's already methylated. And a number of individuals, maybe a quarter or a third, have an MTHFR uh, gene variant. So I sort of take that out of the equation, assuming everybody has it. So I use methylated um, that, and I, I used to use the methylated um, Claritin. So Clarinex is methylated uh, Claritin and Singular, which is a very nice combination. Dermatologists use it all the time. Yeah. I now generally use Adorax, which is an, yes. also an antihistamine, but it's been used in PTSD patients. Because one of the things I find with all of my patients, and, and Jill, I'm sure you do in your patients, is that they're very anxious and very nervous. And I think, you know, one of the first things I tell them is you got to calm down yeah. and maybe do exercises, maybe Tai Chi or yoga or something to help you calm down because the cytokines involved in um, GDD yeah. are similar to the cytokines in stress. So they compound. So try so to like minimize IL-6, which is a huge cytokine we see in depression, anxiety. So it's no wonder, right? Because we're actually seeing the cytokine response on the brain and nervous system. So if anything, if you're out there listening, you're like, yeah, but I can't help it. In a way you can't because your nervous system is creating the anxiety from the cytokines. Right. But the truth is, like you right. said, we still have to deal with it, right? We still have to do whatever we can to calm that system down. Yeah. So so just to briefly touch on, I, actually, I think one of the, the works that I'm most um, proud of of all of my career is we did a, sh a small study looking at serial dynamic cytokine uh, response to chelation. Yeah. And what, what <laughs> actually it was an example of a normal. So I, like you, um, Dr. Jill, I myself have received a number of gadolinium injections uh -huh. and I have like 13, I've had 13 injections. Yeah. Wow. And for many of them, um, getting gadolinium in a Louis Pasteur sort of way, testing uh -huh. for for reactions. <laughs> Easy, so yeah. I didn't want to subject patients to it. Yeah. And then, of course, did all this before realizing about gadolinium wow. deposition disease. I wouldn't have done that right. had I known about <laughs> GDD at the time. But now, you know, the good news is that I'm now the perfect example of somebody who has a lot of gadolinium in them. And the other thing is that, you know, pe you know physicians are so doubtful that gadolinium, you know, stays in there. Yeah. Well, what I find is many people have that medieval thinking of the four um, the four humors. Yes, yes. Uh, but don't actually look into it. So it's very easy. If you don't think that gadolinium is still there, and I know you're wrong, yeah. the way that you can look at it is do chelation with DTPA. Yeah. And you can get gadolinium <laughs> out of anybody who's received, yeah. even if it's many years in the past, particularly if they've had a number. So I, I, my cytokine response, and this is the thing. So we did very short duration, like one minute, five minute, 10 minute, 20 minute, um, uh -huh. 30 minute, an hour and 24 hours. And I did uh, this work with the Stanford Immunology Center. So I wanted to work with, with a group that you could not question yeah. their, you know, ability. Validity right? of I testing. didn't want to use just some local yeah. group of characters. So we came up with the cytokine um, response that they'd never seen before because they'd never have done dynamic cytokines yeah. and chelation, but it would be the same with vaccines is the ideal setting uh -huh. because you're suddenly getting an impact on your immune system. So you yeah. can test exactly. Yeah. So we saw patterns of cytokines peaking at different times. Now the problem is, you know, there was four normals and 10 patients. And as as a physician yourself who's done a lot of research, you realize, you know, to get truly meaningful data to separate, you need in the neighborhood of hundreds or thousands. If you look at the research that's done on asthma, where they have all these different panels of cytokines that they've shown with the different types of asthma, those are probably thousands of patients in each of these groups. And guess what? You know, studies of that nature are in the multi-millions of dollars. Mm -hmm, exactly. So we self-funded it. So I wanted to fund because I wanted to get the work going. Yeah. I didn't, you know, for the sake of patients, I didn't want to wait 
know, I'm going to apply for a grant and right. a year they'll say, well, you could get it, but you need to do this. And then, you know, next thing it's three years down the road and you haven't treated people. So I wanted to treat people right away as soon as I could. So very interesting stuff. I'd love to do larger studies, but yeah. it's a lot of money. It would be lots of money to be. So I think the answer would be with cytokines. Yeah. But what I was struck by is that I've had 13 GPCAs. We did a number of people who had um, pretty bad uh, GDD with just one injection and yeah. we studied them at three months. So they would get tremendous flares from doing chelation. And, and at the time, because I wanted to see a pure flare, we didn't give steroids to them. Yeah. We just did, yeah. you know, did flaroids, uh, steroids after the fact mm -hmm. a day later, but not at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So they had tremendous flares, um, but this is a thing that I found fascinating at the time. Their overall cytokine amounts being released were not that high. The highest in all of all of the people, the highest was me by far. Wow. The next highest was a patient with disease who had four GBCAs. But this is the fascinating thing about cytokines is that, and this is one of the things that I tell people, you know, maybe you don't like the diagnosis of GDD and you're thinking whatever, uh -huh. it's ruining everybody's lives by right. talking about it. But looking at the normals like myself yeah. to figure out what we are doing that is not causing reaction to gadolinium. Exactly. Maybe you the still had a cytokine to many response. autoimmune diseases. What right. cytokines am right. I releasing to prevent me from getting sick? Because my cytokines uh, were yeah. like 10 times anybody else's and yet no symptoms. So, so that's the thing is, is that most of the cytokines are, are, um, are regulatory cytokines, okay. are suppressing cytokines. Well, like and IL-10, in, we in know, me. right? Like IL-10 is right. suppressive. I happen to have a genetic deficiency in that. And I've had a lot of inflammatory issues because I have maybe right. half a quarter production of IL-10. And IL-10 is a cytokine, but what it does is it calms that response. Right. So fascinating right. with your study, yeah. you're, you're putting yourself out there for science. Like you said, that's amazing. Well, I'm going to, if you're listening and one of, if you're a doc, if you're uh, anyone who wants to know the research um, wherever the notes are for where you're listening, I will be sure and include Dr. Samelka's research. Um, I could talk to you for hours. This is so fascinating. And I really want to go back to just um, thank you for being the kind of person that you are, the kind of doctor that you are with curiosity and compassion. And that combination, I think, makes the greatest um, people who discover, like really this is a discovery that's going to change the way we practice medicine in a good way, because there is a place and there is been, uh, you know, a lot of things, a lot of lives saved with gadolinium MRIs and imaging. But now that we know, it's always like I say, once we know what we know, we can't go back, right? Now that we know right. Right. and that you've brought this to the forefront, we have to be stewards of this wonderful technology. What? Right. And um, if you could go back to your younger self, you know, that I rem you're telling us about in Canada and then then realizing this new technology and the power there. And obviously you've done an amazing thing with your career, but what would you go back to tell your younger self knowing what you know now? Anything that any advice you give or encouragement or or things that you would say to your younger self? Do you know, do you know what, Jill, you're asking me something that I was hoping I would have time to mention. So, uh, but in a different way, yeah. but I would tell my younger self, the words of Sir William Osler, patients listened, or sorry, doctors listen to your patients. They're telling you the diagnosis. I would tell my younger self, listen to what patients are telling you at all times, Brilliant. you know? Oh my goodness. That's where like the mic drop, I right? like, but the truth is like, that is where we as healers need to go. I've often said that, heard that and continue to need to be reminded if we can just be present with our patients and really listen, um, we have everything that we need there in that encounter, right? If we just listen and remain curious. Um, well, Dr. Samalka, I am truly honored to have this time with you and to learn more about you and your work. I hope we have another chance to talk <laughs> And I'm just so grateful for you going to that deep level and making the discoveries and then bringing this information because I, as a physician, need it to help my patients and you've laid the foundation. So just a huge thank you from me and all the other docs out there and the patients um, for all of your work.